back. No. I know my voice projects pretty well usually. It doesn't sound like it's totally on there. Is that any better? <coughs> better? Yeah. Better? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll try that. Uh, anyway, it is a pleasure for me to be here, and uh, actually, you may not realize quite what a pleasure it is to be here. I had a little some troubles getting here today, unfortunately, and um, I learned an important lesson about colors on the metro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something about orange and blue, and uh, unfortunately, the wrong one takes you to a very different place than here. So. Anyway, uh, but I am here and uh, very happy to be able to share with you some of the new ideas that I've been working on. And I guess this is really a compilation of various ideas and concepts over the past 15 to 20 years that we have been working in this overall field of neurotheology, I suppose, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is and, and how that works. Uh, to me, uh, what's very exciting about this is the idea that we have an ability to ultimately link together what we can learn from the neuroscientific side of things, the scientific side of things, and how that can be related, intersected, associated with what we learn from religious and spiritual phenomena and experiences and practices. So, uh, I originally wanted to go, since my late colleague Eugene de Quilly was uh, of Italian descent and very much uh, in favor of the Latin, uh, I originally wanted to title this the Principia Neurotheologica, although uh, I guess uh, everyone thought that would be too Latin or too technical, so we went more with just principles of neurotheology. But uh, as I was mentioning, neurotheology really is, in my view, a very unique field of scholarship. It is a way of trying to bring together an understanding uh, of how our brain relates to our religious and spiritual urges, experiences, behaviors, and so forth. And of course, neurotheology itself really more specifically talks about theology, and I think that that's also an area that has not really gotten a lot of attention yet, but something that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on today, about how we can address not only the, the religious experiences that people have, but actually some of the theological content with which many of our religious and spiritual traditions have been developed. Now, uh, part of the reason for even talking about this more formally is that this particular topic of neurotheology has gotten a fair amount of attention. Uh, we've seen, I've seen a lot of articles coming out in a variety of different uh, areas, including <coughs> on the scientific side, in journals like Science, uh, in the popular press like uh, the, uh, the New York Times and Time and Newsweek and that kind of thing. So uh, as well as on the religious side, uh, people who are in various <coughs> religious disciplines uh, and traditions, people who look at religious studies, theology and so forth, uh, all of them have had a great deal of interest in this relationship and trying to better understand it. Now, of course, the problem with neurotheology as a concept, uh, or as a term, I should say, <laughs> is that it does have a bit of baggage to go along with it. There are these two sides, the neuro side, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the theology side. And, uh, and therefore, people sometimes look at this very positively as a way of bringing together these two, what are often disparate ways of looking at the world. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes people have been very critical of neurotheology in terms of the idea of trying to link together two things that shouldn't be linked. So these are the kinds of issues and kinds of problems that I think become very important for us to be able to address as formally as possible if neurotheology as a field is going to be something that's viable going forward. So part of my goal today, and part of my goal in writing this book on principles of neurotheology, was to kind of set out the foundations of what I, at least in my uh, humble view, this field would look like. And some of the ideas that we need to think about from a methodological perspective, from an interpretive perspective, a philosophical perspective, from all the different uh, perspectives that might be brought to bear on what neurotheology actually is. So, what can we start to look at? Well, as I mentioned, uh, one of the things that has become very important in my work, because I have been doing so much research looking at brain scans, and I'll show some of these a little bit later on, but brain scans of people engaged in practices like meditation or prayer, for example, is how does one develop the methodology to do that? 
Uh, when we're talking about cognitive neuroscience today, we've gotten very advanced and very adept at our abilities to see what's going on in the brain when we are doing a whole bunch of different types of tasks and working memory and language and so forth and using different kinds of imaging and other types of equipment to study what's going on in the brain itself. We can get into very detailed views as to what different parts of the brain appear to be able to do. But the study of religious and spiritual phenomena takes on a very problematic a set of issues when you try to bring neuroscience to bear on what is going on when people engage in these practices. In part because these practices are already defined. This is not like something where you can put somebody into an MRI machine and ask them to start singing a religious song. That may be a lot more difficult than having somebody just work through some mathematics task. So the methods that we use, how do we study these, these practices? How do we study the experiences? How do we get at what the experiences are actually all about for the individual? What is the subjective nature of those experiences? Uh, what is the person thinking about, feeling about, behaving about in their approach to their religious or spiritual tradition? So there are a lot of methodological questions that come up in terms of how we begin to design studies and develop studies to help us better understand what the relationship is between neuroscience, what's going on in the brain, and what we think about or feel about from a religious or spiritual perspective. Some of the principles also are trying to look at both the scientific side of things as well as the religious or theological side of things. And the reason I think that that's important is that too often times when we start to engage in this relationship between the human person, particularly the brain, but the body as well, and what's going on spiritually, sometimes people take a very one-way view of this. For a number of people, it becomes the neuroscience of religious or spiritual phenomena. And therefore, it's just a way of studying religion from a different perspective. What I try to argue is that the religious and theological perspective also has something to tell us about the science side. So I think we have to look at what our biases are, what our approaches are from a scientific perspective, from a religious and theological perspective, and to figure out a way to kind of bring them together and get them enmeshed in an overall field of study that can fall under this term of neurotheology. That all being said, I hope that the principles that we would begin to utilize in the context of neurotheology would be those that would be acceptable, available, whatever term you want to use, to both the scientific side of things and the religious or theological side as well. And if it's only a, a useful principle from the scientific side, then that means that we're leaving something out from the context of the religious or spiritual side, and vice versa. So I think, again, we, it's very important, at least from my own personal view, to try to understand the best way of linking together what we can learn scientifically and what we can learn spiritually or religiously to really help us to get at what ultimately, in my view, are some of the really big questions, some of these big epistemological questions, ontological questions that have challenged humanity since the beginning of time. So hopefully, uh, my purpose here today, again, and, and in, our, in, this, uh, in this book, is the idea of how can we develop these principles that can be useful as a foundation for future scholarship, regardless of whether somebody decides to come at neurotheology from a specifically scientific side, an anthropological side, philosophical side, theological side. What are the principles of scholarship that need to be thought about, considered, as a person develops this level of scholarship? Now, I'd like to give a little bit of a, of a very brief history, because I think this is important to see where neurotheology ultimately comes from. A lot of people say, well, why, why even bother with this particular topic at all? And part of my argument has been that we really see that the, the, the preliminary, the rudiments of neurotheology, even in some of the earliest sacred texts arising out of both Eastern and Western traditions. So certainly if we look at a lot of the Buddhist and Hindu texts, there's a great deal of emphasis on the human mind, on the human self, on human consciousness. There's a lot of descriptions about how does one engage our consciousness, what are the ways in which we can modify, alter our level of consciousness, alter our sense of consciousness, our sense of self, our sense of awareness. So in this process, obviously 3,000 years ago, we did not have available the, you know, the functional MRIs and the PET scans and all that that we currently have today, but there was this sense that there was an important relationship between what was going on inside of our brains, the psyche of, of who we are, and our consciousness, our spiritual selves, our religious selves. Again, Western traditions also perhaps didn't engage in the t concept of consciousness quite so directly, 
but there is a great deal of discussion about what the human person is, what our frailties are, what things we should do, shouldn't do, what we're supposed to be as people. And in that context, I think there is, again, at least this sense that there's a part of ourselves, a part of who we are physically and materially, that needs to be able to engage these concepts as well as whatever spiritual uh, self that we may you know, believe that we have. And in bringing this a little bit further, so again, Buddhism in particular uh, elaborates on the important elements of human consciousness, and it organizes these, for those not familiar, just a very brief review, uh, into the four seals of belief. and talks about dukkha, uh, which refers to suffering, and is considered in many ways the essential or universal part of the human condition. This is what we all face and what we must all somehow have to deal with. Uh, anatta refers to the sense of no self, and in particular, that there is this, uh, that there is no separate existing self in the universe. Everything is somehow interconnected. So there isn't this us versus the world or us versus the universe, but somehow we need to think about how ourselves, our consciousness of ourselves, becomes a part of the larger whole, a part of a universal consciousness, the universe itself. Again, it depends on what your own individual perspectives ultimately are. And the Buddhist perspective is the notion of a universal consciousness. Anika refers to the sense of impermanence, such that nothing in this world actually lasts forever. The idea that things are always changing. And again, this is a very critical concept, concept in the context of the human brain and our ability to change, adapt, evolve, transcend, transform from one stage of ourselves to the next. Because if that is ultimately our goal, which is how do we transform ourselves, transform our consciousness into something beyond where we are today, then we need to recognize the ability of our brain, of our self, of our consciousness to change and adapt and to advance ourselves from one moment of life to the next, from one stage of life to the next. And of course, nirvana, the idea of the release from suffering, which generally happens when we ultimately surrender our attachments to the world. So that we really, that, that there is this kind of false sense of ourself that feels like it's separate from the world and has all these attachments and this is what causes our suffering. If we can go beyond that, we can get our consciousness up to the level of the universal consciousness, then we can go beyond our suffering and advance to the next level of human consciousness. We see this idea about neurotheology in other aspects of Eastern thought, the concept of yin and yang, I think, uh, resonates very much with regard to how the human brain works in general. Uh, we so often talk about kind of the, the way that the brain is set in a, sense, a set of tone, for example, that there are kind of balances that are going on. Different parts of the brain balance each other out. And, and if you turn one of them on, then you might feel a strong emotion. If you turn the other one off, you'll suppress that emotion and bring in a different level of thought. So the idea that there are different ways in which the brain and the body really rest in a, a sense of tone, a sense of balance between these different forces, I think directly relates very nicely to the concept of yin yang. In fact, again, another uh, very important aspect of how the brain works is in the autonomic nervous system. And for those not familiar with that concept, uh, our, our brain, our body, has what's called the autonomic nervous system, which regulates a lot of our basic body functions so that we can be in a state of alertness and arousal, which is mediated by what's called the sympathetic nervous system, or a sense of calmness and quiescence, which is part of the parasympathetic system. And again, these are in a nice balance between each other, so that if we need to suddenly respond to something urgent, if we're caught, in, if the building suddenly caught on fire and we all had to get out of here quickly, then our balance shifts so that our, our arousal system kicks in. And if it's time to go to sleep, it might then our calming, our quiescent side of the, of the our autonomic nervous system kicks in. So again, we see this concept of yin and yang, this concept of balance, this concept of how the different parts of our body and our brain relate to each other that becomes ultimately a part of what we can think about from a neurotheological perspective. Now, as I mentioned, even in uh, the Judeo-Christian context of the self and of our own sense of religious and spiritual values and beliefs, uh, the Bible talks a lot about the rules and guidelines of what we are to be as human beings and how we are to live our lives. The, the various covenants and commandments that uh, human beings engage in with God talk a lot about the understanding of human behavior, uh, of human frailties, of limitations, and of human morality. And if we're going to understand all of these different concepts, 
I think it's imperative for us to realize how our brain can actually engage these ideas and engage these concepts. And that, to me, is it, in some sense, it's sort of obvious, right? I mean, if we're going to have to follow a certain commandment, it has to be something that we are capable of following, else it doesn't really make sense. So if we begin to look at how our brain works, how our ideas and our beliefs come together to enable us to form our, our beliefs going forward, our ideas and our behaviors, then that can be very valuable in helping us to learn how to deal with whatever religious doctrines we are ultimately faced with. Thomas Aquinas in his uh, text Summa Theologica specifically talks about the distinction between an actus hominis and an actus humanus, the idea that there is this kind of material body part of ourselves, and then there is this sort of human spiritual part of ourselves, the soul of ourselves, and how they relate to each other. So we see in the medieval time this duality between the body and the soul, the body and the spirit. Again, he didn't have the ability to look at MRI machines and, and look at brain scans, but he was touching on something. He was thinking about these ideas and this relationship. So ultimately, we can learn to look towards our current state of cognitive neuroscience to try to deal with this duality. Where does the brain begin and end? Where do, it, where do our thoughts, our mind, our consciousness begin and end? Where does our spiritual self begin and end? Wonderful, wonderful questions for neurotheology to be able to address as we go forward. Now, as we do approach a little bit more, again, a little bit more of the historical side coming up towards the, the, the 1400s, the Reformation, um, some fascinating arguments broke out about the nature of how human beings are to be spiritual, how we are to be religious. The idea of uh, you know, what is really the center of our creation. Is it humanity? Is it the human being as the center of creation? How do we relate to God in some form or another? And um, uh, Erasmus got into some very interesting arguments with Martin Luther about how to get salvation. And of course, again, if you start now thinking about neurotheology, what exactly does salvation mean? And if we are going to be saved, isn't it not just our spiritual selves, but our biological selves as well? And how would that happen? Is there some way that we can think about that from a neuroscientific perspective? There was also a great deal of debate about the nature of human free will and the importance of human free will and the human mind in, able, in being able to enable that sense of free will and what we can do. And of course, again, we are with our current cognitive neuroscience, we have a sense of the parts of the brain that might be related to our sense of free will. The frontal lobes, which often have been described as the seat of the will, for example, are the parts of our brain located behind our forehead that enable us to begin to plan and, and come up with whatever uh, approaches to our daily life, to whatever things we might want to think about. They help us to create our language. And many times these are the areas of the brain that get activated as we purposely will ourselves to do certain things in our daily lives and in our, in our, in, throughout our lives. So if we can begin to look at what's going on in the brain when we start to make decisions and start to make moral decisions, uh, other types of planned willful decisions, this may help us to better understand the nature of free will, which ultimately ties back to this debate 500 years ago between Martin Luther and Erasmus as to the nature of free will and what that ultimately meant in terms of human salvation. So it all starts to tie together very, very nicely. Descartes, of course, was of critical importance to philosophy and cognitive neuroscience. Um, he spent so much time talking about uh, what we can know from a rational perspective, what we can know from a contemplative type of process, his, his, um, his investigation, uh, his, his meditations uh, on philosophical investigations was really uh, a very unique and very powerful way of looking at how the human mind can get at some of the fundamental questions that have perplexed humanity from the beginning of time. He ultimately came up with the notion, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, which again ties very nicely back into the whole sense of cognitive neuroscience and into neurotheology, the idea that the, what we are thinking about, what's going on in our brain, is what is related to our existence, our ability to understand ourselves as who we are, and how we begin to derive knowledge and understanding about our world. So Descartes was very critical, I think, in developing some of the fundamental concepts of cognitive neuroscience, that it is our thoughts and our feelings that really make us who we are, and of course, again, didn't have necessarily the knowledge of the brain, but understood the importance of how that brain relates to all of our thoughts and our feelings. Now, of course, part of the problem that we ultimately saw 
with Descartes was the notion that there was this duality, that there was sort of this great distinction between the mind and the brain. And this is an interesting problem that has perplexed a lot of people in philosophy and consciousness studies. Uh, again, it kind of comes back to what I was just talking about. Where does the brain end? Where does consciousness begin? How are they related to each other? It was a duality which um, in many ways persists. We often think about the ability of the brain to have thoughts, the ability of the brain to have consciousness. But the question that many Buddhists, for example, have always asked is whether or not consciousness exists outside of the brain. And if so, how does that happen? What is the relationship then between something which exists outside of the brain and what's going on inside of our brain? So these are just wonderful questions from, I think, a, a, a very appropriate approach of neurotheology to begin to look at because the neurotheology is really looking at the way in which we can combine what we can learn from a neuroscientific perspective and what we can learn from this other consciousness, spiritual type of perspective. <coughs> this is, I think, going to be the ultimate power that neurotheology has as a field of scholarship. Kant in his critique of pure reason uh, implied that all of the universe, both spiritual and non-spiritual, could be understood through hum a human rational approach. Again, touching right on the, the, the tenets of neurotheology, the idea that the ways in which we think and feel about our world inform us about both the material and whatever is non-material in the world, the sense of our spirituality. Uh, the idea that there is some kind of pure reason that is something that we can attain through our own thought processes, through the fundamental functions of the brain itself. And, and then, of course, he also argued that reason seeks to know what lies beyond the range of experience. So we have our perceptions and our experiences, but that there actually may be a way of getting beyond that in some regard through our rational functions, our contemplative functions, and that this may have some ability to get at what are the fundamental rules and laws that govern the universe. Now, in more recent times, as we get a little bit closer to the past century, um, especially in the context of religious and spiritual beliefs, we see Friedrich Schleiermacher, who talks about the sense of religious or spiritual ideas from a more cognitive and visceral sense. Now, this is a bit of a departure because up until this time, most of what we learned about from the theological perspective, from the religious perspective, was the notion that it was very doctrinal, that it was what was in the sacred text, that was what was important. Schleiermacher is the first to talk about it from this more visceral sense. What does it feel like? that religious or spiritual beliefs or feelings are a feeling of absolute dependency, that was his definition. William James extrapolated this and expanded this in his Varieties of Religious Experience, where he talked about all the different forms that our religious experience can take, especially in terms of human experience. And he talked about both what, he, what might be termed normal kinds of religious and spiritual states and experiences, and also abnormal kinds of experiences. So he certainly had this sense that it was what was going on in the brain, what was going on in our mind, that colored and affected the religious and spiritual beliefs that we hold. Rudolf Otto, in 1917, wrote a book called The Idea of the Holy, and here he defined the essence of religious awareness as a sense of awe, and he actually described this as a mysterium tremendum et fascinans, this notion that it was a, a kind of fear, but also fascination with that which was ultimate, and therefore, again, this experiential element to this thought process, uh, uh, some type of cognitive process going on in the mind, in the brain, that enables us to have our religious and spiritual feelings. And Mircea Eliade talked about religion not just as the God encounter, but also the sense of sacredness in the symbols and the rituals that are a part of our religious and spiritual traditions. This is very critical when we begin to look at how our brain begins to engage religious and spiritual ideas because it is ultimately the practices, the rituals, the ideas that our brain comes face to face with that enables it to begin to have these kinds of feelings. So in our more recent developments, my late colleague Eugene DeQuilly uh, really tried to address the issue of ritual head on. And he talked about the development of rituals in animals and how they are ultimately elaborated in human beings and then extrapolated what we know from the basics of ritual to the notion of what's going on in religious and spiritual rituals. The ceremonial mass, uh, the, the, the weddings, the funerals, the different life events that occur in a religious or spiritual context and the rituals that go on that help to really drive into the human person, into the human brain, the experiences that we ultimately refer to as religious or spiritual. And a number of other investigators, James Ashbrook, Ron Josephs, James Austin, 
Uh, all of these individuals have written books that have looked at various ways in which our human mind, our human brain relates to religious and spiritual experiences, some from very specific perspectives. James Ashbrook talks about this from a more Christian perspective. Austin talks about it from the Buddhist perspective. And as we've gotten in the last 20 years, we have really developed uh, the methodologies to begin to engage these kinds of topics in a much fuller way, the ability to use brain scans and other types of measurement to understand exactly what is going on, or as best as possible, what's going on in the human person, in the human brain, when people engage in their religious or spiritual pursuits. And this is where I think neuro neurotheology ultimately will lead to, at least as an important part. So now let's try to look at, now that we have this kind of background, the historical background of where neurotheology comes from, uh, and hopefully that has convinced you to some degree of the importance of neurotheology as a field, I'd like to elaborate on at least some of the different principles that I think are relevant in the context of how this scholarship should go in the future. And I think one of the first ones is the ability to define our terms well. And this is notoriously problematic. I teach a course in neurotheology at the University of Pennsylvania. And in the first uh, three sessions, really, we spend a lot of time simply going over what do we mean by religion? What do we mean by spirituality? And then, of course, you could throw in other terms. What do we mean by morality? What do we mean by God? Uh, what do we mean by faith, soul? And I, mean, I could even ask to all of you to start thinking about, you know, we sort of have a sense of what it is. We kind of recognize it when we, when we think about it. If I say, what's religion to you? I think most of you would give me some kind of definition. But if I started writing these up on the board, we would start to see a great deal of similarities, but also a lot of differences in what your views are of religiousness and what your views are of spirituality. And the sources of these definitions also become a very intriguing issue or problem, because if I'm to come at it from a scientific perspective, I may want an operational definition. I may want something that I can measure in a laboratory. I may want to know what somebody's spiritual feeling is and how do I get at that? What, what kind of question can I ask? What kind of scan can I do? That can be very different from a sociological perspective, an anthropological perspective, a philosophical or theological perspective. So who is coming up with the definitions and how they are thinking about them is almost as relevant as what the definitions actually are. In fact, if I were to bring together a room full of scientists and a room full of theologians, they would probably come up with completely different views of what religion and spirituality are. That all being said, I think one of the critical aspects of whatever definitions we decide to come to, and I guess part of my, my thought process is here, is that we need to at least establish what a given individual's definition is. So if somebody's going to present to you data on a study that they did of a person's religiousness, what at least did they mean by religiousness? What were they asking about? What kind of ideas and, and concerns did they have in their definition? Is important so that we're at least understanding what they're trying to tell us. That being said, I think that whatever definitions we come to today are probably going to be adaptable, malleable, and transformable as time goes on. As we develop new data, as we learn new things, we're going to see these definitions change over time. And that's also important because we shouldn't get so stuck in our definitions that we wind up missing some big part of what it means to be religious or spiritual simply because we defined it this way from the beginning and we're not going to, to adapt or change that as we go through our research. <coughs> Now, I mentioned at the beginning a little bit about what I think neurotheology is, so let me emphasize this a little bit more. I think neurotheology refers to the field of study that links the neurosciences with religion and theology in its basic statement. It is not a neuroscientific study of theology, and it is not a theological study of neuroscience. It really has to be a two-way street, I think, for both of the scientific as well as the religious or spiritual perspectives if they're really going to be able to contribute to each other. And I think one of the most critical aspects of this definition is that the neuro side and the theology side need to be defined very broadly. For me to make this term work, for me personally again, I think the neuro side has to include neuroscience, has to include psychology, uh, cognitive neuroscience, anthropology, sociology, all of this can potentially be brought into the realm of the neuro side of things. And the theology side, I think we also have to define very broadly because we can't just talk about theology proper, which is a very specific thing. But we have to think about religious experiences, religious practices, spirituality, different types of ecstatic experiences, mystical experiences, transformative experiences, 
uh, doctrines, text, textual analyses, philosophical issues, all of this can also fall under the overall context of theology in this regard. And I think unless we really keep our terms fairly broad in this regard, neurotheology is going to wind up being very, very limited and not really be able to do all of the things that it ultimately can do. Now, neurotheology also needs to be skeptical. And of course, whenever we deal with issues pertaining to religious and spiritual beliefs, there are a lot of different viewpoints on that. Those who are very religious individuals feel very strongly about their beliefs. Those who are not very religious, those who are atheists or agnostics, may have a great deal of skepticism. And I think for neurotheology to work, uh, it, it has to have a good deal of skepticism. There is a scientific component to it. But I also like to encourage that it be a constructive and, and optimistic skepticism, so to speak. It is a way in which we can kind of better understand, where we can better ask the questions and try to really better interpret whatever information we get out of the studies that, we, that would fall under the realm of neurotheology. I think we have to be very cautious about whatever conclusions we draw. So if we have some study of intercessory prayer and people who are praying for individuals to get better from heart disease, if it turns out that it works, we have to be cautious about what does that mean? Does that really mean that our prayers went to God and, and, and ultimately helped people get better? Does it mean that human consciousness somehow reached across the gap and affected the person's health at a distance? What exactly did happen? Are we sure of our methods? Are we sure that the results are right? So these are the kinds of things that we have to think about. But we have to be careful about being overly negative that if things don't go so well or if we have some questions, the, the data didn't look that good or the methods weren't that good, uh, we have to be careful about not just throwing everything out simply because we just didn't like the way the methods or the particular conclusions came about. We also have to be aware of our own biases our own beliefs as they come to bear on whatever uh, particular studies that we may be pursuing on our own. And I always like to argue that it's very critical for us to have a great passion for inquiry. We really need to always ask the question. It's always important for us to learn and to develop new knowledge and try to understand better both what's going on inside of our brain as well as what's going on in our religious or spiritual lives. There are lots of great questions for us to ask. And we have to be very conscious of keeping that passion of inquiry burning as much as possible. Now that being said, uh, a couple of interesting issues I think arise, especially in the context of science and religion. Uh, we often hear Occam's razor being utilized as a way of kind of diminishing the importance of religion. I, I won't botch the Latin, so I'll go right to the English, but the idea that plurality should not be positive without necessity is what Occam ultimately said. The idea that we shouldn't start to postulate lots of new ideas, lots of things, if we don't need them to explain a particular phenomena. If we don't need, and, and this is why it's been used in the context of religion, that many people, many scientists will argue, well, you know, we can explain weather, we can explain how the universe came about and so forth, so we don't need to postulate God. That's not a necessary requirement for explaining the phenomena. But I think neurotheology has a counter perspective on that. And I just flipped the words around a little bit, but I think it's a very important point that necessity should not be posited without plurality. And the point I'm trying to make here is the idea that one of the problems with the Occam's razor argument is the term necessity. Because we don't know what necessity means. We don't know exactly what is necessary to explain the world. And if that's the case, then don't we have to at least acknowledge what the plurality is, what the other possibilities are, the, the spiritual, uh, religious, other types of perspectives that might bring to bear some information before we start knocking them out of the way and saying, well, they can't be true because we have other data to support the fact that they're not true. And I think that there are many issues and many questions that we will be forced to look at where we may not be able to get all the information that we need to know. And therefore, we may need to look at both the scientific as well as the spiritual perspective. One of my favorite stories back when I was a medical student uh, one of our doctors was, was relating a story when he went to Africa and he was treating individuals with malaria and there was a, a, a person who came to him, a gentleman who came to him to get medicine for the malaria and uh, he gave him the medicine and a, a, a couple days later he saw him going into the, the place where the local uh, shaman was, the medicine person, what medicine man was and it, he kind of grabbed the guy by the side and said, well, look, you know, you came to me for the medicine um, and because you obviously believe Western science is going to cure the malaria, why would you bother to go to the medicine man who, you know, it's all sort of spiritual stuff and, and just doesn't explain anything to you? 
He said, well, no, actually, there is a reason why I do both. I come to you because I got malaria and I need to be cured from the malaria. I go to the medicine man because I want to understand why I got the malaria. Mm -hmm. So there's other aspects, there's other knowledge that we need to get about our world that we have to be careful about what we exclude too quickly before we really understand why we may or may not need it. Another term that I think is, um, I've been trying to explore over the past uh, five years or so <coughs> comes from a more philosophical term, hermeneutics, and the idea of a neurotheological hermeneutics. A hermeneutics uh, for those of you not familiar with the term, really refers to how we interpret, I guess very specifically, it's how we interpret specific texts, how we interpret certain ideas. And the idea that if we're going to read the Bible, if we're going to read Aquinas or Kant or whatever, we need to look at it not just from our own personal perspective, from, but from the perspective of the individual writing it. And what was going on in their mind and in their lives, what, was the, what were the times like, what was the cultural setting like, the religious setting, and what were they like? Well, it seems to me that one of the most important perspectives that so often gets overlooked is what's going on in the brain itself. So if somebody comes to the notion that causality is everything, or rationality is everything, or spirituality is everything, what's going on in their brain? What's being triggered in their brain? What parts of their brain are maybe being turned on or being turned off? And can we utilize that information to think about how our brain really wraps itself around these very important ideas? So I think it can be useful in interpreting science, it can be useful for interpreting philosophical and uh, theological texts, and also the experiences itself. So again, this, and I think an important aspect of this is that neurotheology, and in this context, neurotheological hermeneutics, would not necessarily diminish the more traditional perspective of hermeneutics, philosophical hermeneutics, spirituality, science, but it adds a new perspective, it adds an integrated perspective that enables us to look at these questions and address them in ways that we've never really been able to do before. Now I mentioned early on the importance of methodology, and I think that we really, if we're going to push neurotheology as a field, then both theology and the neuroscience part of neurotheology have to allow for new methods, new concepts, and new conclusions to arise. Now that may sound sort of obvious, but so often we tend to think that, well, this is the kind of answer that we're looking for, or this is the paradigm that we're, we're trying to shoot for, and I think we really need to start to kind of bridge across gaps and think about things in new ways. Uh, how can we use a brain scan to study something spiritual or philosophical? Uh, can, we, you know, can we get somebody like Immanuel Kant into a scanner and have them do some philosophical musings and see what areas of the brain light up? Is that going to be useful or important? And sometimes, you know, it's almost the, well, it's so crazy, it just might work kind of stuff that we need to think about. So we need to really kind of, you know, to use the, the term, think outside of the box, think about new ways of doing things, and, and embrace whatever new ideas come down the road. There may be so many ways of using the internet, using neuroscience, using different aspects of, of subjective evaluations and so forth that we just haven't thought about before. And I think it's important for us to be open and, and be available to utilize these different approaches, both from the scientific as well as from the theological perspective. Now another very, very important aspect of this is the necessity of kind of looking at the subjective nature of these experiences, the phenomenological characteristics of these experiences that we call religious and spiritual. I think this is fundamentally important to neurotheology because one of the concerns that I've had over the years, and I've seen people do studies like this, where they'll say, well, we were able to, we gave somebody a drug and it induced a spiritual experience or it induced a religious experience. But sometimes they didn't understand what exactly a religious or spiritual experience is, what that drug-induced experience was, and how they are related to each other. So I think that it becomes very important for us to understand the phenomenological aspects of these different kinds of experiences and ideas, how they are measurable, how do we get at the measure of them, both subjectively as well as objectively if that's possible, and how do we integrate what we can learn phenomenologically from uh, by integrating it with the scientific perspective. In fact, one of the, the studies that we have been doing over the past several years is an online survey of people's spiritual experiences. And it's been fascinating to look at this data. We, we, we're just we're, we're sort of drowning in the data almost because there are, we've had thousands of people come to the website and provide narratives as to what their spiritual experiences are like. And it's fascinating because sometimes people will describe a sense of God's love for them. Sometimes they'll say they felt a force. Sometimes they felt an energy. Sometimes they felt 
uh, a sense of awe. What are those experiences? Are they all the same? Are they all fundamentally the same and then described differently by people? Are they fundamentally different and yet all felt to be spiritual? Is there something about them which makes them feel spiritual to the individual and why do they call it a spiritual experience instead of just you know, an everyday experience? What, what's going on there? And understanding that, ph that phenomenology I think is so important and so interesting but so critical as we go forward in trying to understand the true nature of what religious and spiritual experiences are all about. And again, to kind of follow up with what I just talked about, therefore we really need to look at all the different methods for evaluating these kinds of experiences. We need to look at the subjective side, the objective side, what's going on in the brain, what's going on electrically in the brain, blood flow wise, serotonin wise. There's so many different things that we can begin to look at that can all be brought to bear in helping us evaluate the nature of these religious and spiritual experiences. Neurotheology also tells us something about neuroscience, and I think we can apply it to a wide range of cognitive processes. You know, uh, somebody once made the, the remark to me that if we really are going to understand consciousness or mental control, if you will, I guess they were talking about more specifically, why wouldn't we study intense meditators who have incredible mental control? That would be a wonderful way of trying to understand what helps us to feel mental control, or how do we look at, screen out, whatever tasks that we want to look at, people's functions in the brain. When we look at religious and spiritual experiences, we are talking about some very complex cognitive tasks. They involve cognitions, they involve emotions, behaviors, movements, and so forth. So if they are engaging all these different things, then maybe this can help us from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, because maybe it will tell us how, does our, how, how do our emotions relate to our thoughts? How do our emotions relate to our moral reasoning? There's a lot of really fascinating questions that come up which can help us in terms of our understanding of what the human brain is and how the human brain actually works. Ultimately, also in this context, we can utilize this information to perhaps help us to use our brain better. Maybe, as I'll show in just a second, we've been doing some brain scan studies of people, of older individuals who have memory problems, and we set them off on a, on a meditation program what happens to them? What happens to their brain? What happens to their ability to think? Their ability to keep to maintain their memory? Is this valuable? Is it useful from a health perspective, a mental health perspective, a physical health perspective? So there are lots of very interesting questions that we can begin to look at. And I think also neurotheology needs to be very aware of the notion of the negative sides of, the, of religion. And there are many aspects or many ways in which religion can turn negative on people. Obviously, the most obvious, of course, is when people enter into things like cults and, and kill themselves in mass murder, or terrorists who will try to kill themselves and other people because they don't believe the same way that they do. What, what's going on? How do, why do people go down that path? What's going on in their brain that makes some argument along those lines seem reasonable to them, seem rational to them? Does this information, can we use this information to help us better understand the nature of the terrorist mind, the nature of a cult's mind, and can we use this to help maybe even redirect people in a more positive way. We also see negative aspects of religious and spiritual beliefs occur in people uh, who are just everyday people. Maybe they're people dealing with a particular illness, cancer, for example, and they wonder why they got cancer. It goes back to my story of, 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 of the medicine man. Maybe they're wondering, were they not spiritual enough? Uh, is God out there to punish them? And if God's punishing them, then why should they take part in the chemotherapy regimen that the doctor recommended? So we have an ability to try to understand what's going on in the mind and the psyche of people when they turn to religion in a negative way and they feel that God is not on their side. And does that help us to try to figure out ways of turning that process around into something that is more beneficial? And in fact, there are some very interesting approaches to psychotherapy these days that try to incorporate religious and spiritual concepts and try to find ways of helping people deal not only with the psychological issues that they face, but with the spiritual issues that they may be, that may be holding them down along, the, along with whatever psychological problems they have. And when we talk about consciousness, again, one of the most important experiences that people have from a religious or spiritual perspective are the altered states of consciousness, the mystical consciousness, which in many ways is the most transformative kind of experience that they can have. And if we can find individuals who, have, who are going to have that kind of experience or have had that kind of experience, 
can we utilize this kind of technology? Can we utilize imaging studies, other types of subjective measures to better understand what is going on cognitively, emotionally, behaviorally? How do these experiences of altered states of consciousness, near-death experiences, and so forth, how do they change people's lives? How do they change their perspective on themselves, on life, on death, and so forth? And therefore, neurotheology can help us to try to address that question of what is the nature of our consciousness? How is it altered by these experiences? And what happens to that consciousness down the road? In fact, we might even get to the more problematic, uh, thorny philosophical question of the actual nature of the universe itself. There have been, obviously, two different perspectives in that regard. There is the notion that everything in our universe is matter and that consciousness arises out of that matter, or the notion that consciousness is everything and somehow matter arises out of consciousness. Or perhaps we have some hybrid of those two. Well, I think neurotheology is right for being able to address that kind of big question. Uh, again, it may not be, it certainly may not be the, uh, the end all in terms of answering it, and I don't think that it would be, but the idea that we can begin to address these questions in ways that we've never been able to before because we can link up what we can learn from a scientific side, a consciousness studies per side, and a spiritual or religious side that will provide, hopefully, some new information in regard to these kinds of questions. And this is one of the scans that we um, uh, obtained recently as part of our study of meditation. This came from our memory study. This was published uh, this past year in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, actually, because we took individuals, older individuals, who were complaining of memory problems. And these were scans, uh, these are called SPECT scans, and they are uh, looking at blood flow changes in the brain. If you look at these, these are actually kind of slices through the brain, so it's as if I kind of slice through the head, took the, the top of the head off, and now you're looking down on the brain and seeing the areas of activity. So these are functional images of the brain. And the way to look at them is that the, the red areas are the most active, followed by the yellow, and then the blue and the black. The first scan, uh, label A, was the original baseline scan. The person came in for the study, we signed them up, got a scan. So this is just what they look like at rest the very first day. Scan B is what happened after we taught them the meditation practice for the very first time. It was a particular practice called Kirtan Kriya, which is, is a mantra-based practice where the individual says four sounds, sa, ta, na, ma, those four sounds over and over. And while they do that, they actually move their fingers. These are called mudras, and this derives out of the Kundalini Yoga tradition. So it looks like this. They go sa, ta, na, ma. So you can touch your index finger to your thumb, then the middle finger, fourth finger, and the fifth finger. You go sa, ta, na, ma. And they did this for 12 minutes a day. And, uh, and there was a little twist to it because they had to do it out loud, and then they did you know, in a whisper, and then in silence, and so forth. But they just did it for 12 minutes a day. And we watched them. We had them do it for eight weeks. And then we brought them back. So the scans on the bottom row, C is the scan when they first came back baseline scan, so it compares to the A scan. And then this is the second scan when they were now doing the meditation after they had trained in the practice for quite a period of time. The arrows are focusing on a very important structure called the thalamus. It's a very central structure in the brain, a very key relay in the brain. Relays a lot of our sensory information up from the brain, or up from the body, up to the brain, and also connects different parts of the brain to each other. So it's a very important part of our brain. It appears to be related to consciousness, and it's probably also important in just our overall perceptions of the world and our, our viewpoints on reality. And you'll notice that there's some interesting changes that start to occur in this thalamus. So when the person first came in, you can see where the arrow is pointed. There's a little bit more red on that side than there is on the other side, okay? So that means that this is the way this person was wired. A lot of us have a little asymmetry to begin with. Um, and this is just the way our brain is situated. This is the way they were built. When they did the practice for the first time, you can see that those red areas changed a little bit. They're more symmetric. In fact, maybe even a little bit more active on the other side. But you know, for the most part, I would say they're, they're relatively symmetric and relatively equal. Now, that's kind of interesting, but not totally unexpected because, OK, well, they did this practice, and maybe it affects the thalamus in some way. But now they come back. And here they are two months later. And you can see that the asymmetry that was there at rest in the first scan is no longer there on the second scan. It's very symmetric. And in fact, when they engage in the practice after an eight-week training period now, you can see that the other side of the thalamus is much more active than the, the side that was active initially. So what are we seeing here? We are seeing 
the ways in which doing a simple meditation practice changes your brain over a relatively short period of time doing a relatively easy kind of practice. 12 minutes a day for eight weeks did this to your brain. So you can imagine what would happen to somebody's brain if they engage in a very intense practice for a long period of time. Or when people are religious or spiritual their entire lives, it has to change the way your brain works. And if you engage in some new belief system or a new practice, it's going to change it in a different way. And we, begin, we can begin to look at this, we can begin to assess this, and we want to then relate this back to, okay, well, did their spirituality change? Did their psychological status change? What's going on? And we can look not just at, this is just looking at blood flow changes in the brain, but there are all kinds of neurotransmitters and all different kinds of uh, areas of activity that we can look at in the brain that we really just have scratched the surface in terms of what we can do. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that we can also address theological questions. And I think to some degree we should, I don't think any theological idea or issue should be off the table just yet. Many questions that are kind of fundamental to theology, the nature of God, uh, the nature of salvation, the nature of good and evil, of right and wrong, of free will, uh, all of these are questions that our brain tangles with. And maybe it would be helpful to know how our brain does tangle with it. What are the brain's abilities? What are its limitations? What are, are there certain reasons why we have a perception of free will? Certain perceptions of how our brain can, how we can be spiritual and what does that mean? Are there certain causal relationships that we just naturally draw and why do we draw them? So whether or not we will get to some more definitive answer, I don't know. And that's why I have May here in bold. But I think neuro neurotheology may contribute to a lot of these very, very big theological questions. It certainly provides a new perspective at the least and maybe actually will provide some new answers or some new information that just we haven't thought about before because we've never linked these ideas together. Now I think that there is also what I would refer to as a neurotheological uncertainty principle, and, and this is meant to sound a little bit like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle for you physics folks out there. The notion that there is a fundamental uncertainty of how we look at the universe. Well, cognitive neuroscience and neurotheology would argue that there is a fundamental uncertainty. We are all trapped within our brain. We are all looking out at the world and receive sensory information and different types of information. We think things, but ultimately, whatever we view the world as is our own perspective. It's our own brain's creation of our viewpoint on the world. And we hope, with reasonable, with important hope, and we're probably generally correct, that what we perceive on the inside is commensurate with what is out there on the outside. But we don't know that for sure. We don't know if the ways in which we perceive the world or think about the world are really accurate. And there's lots and lots of studies that show all of the flaws that our brain can make in our perceptions, in our thoughts, in our feelings about whatever we may have thought or heard or seen before. When we think back on a big event in our lives, most studies show that our memory is not that great. And therefore we make lots of mistakes, our brain fills in information and doesn't bother to tell us all the time what it's filled in with. Um, so there are lots of problems, and therefore, we have this kind of fundamental uncertainty about our world. Now, science helps us to get into what that uncertainty is, but since we are trapped within our brain even when we look at science, we, it may take some of these unusual states of consciousness, these spiritual states, mystical states of consciousness, where the person's sense of self, sense of objective and subjective reality go away, that may contribute to a deeper understanding of what our nature of reality is and may be able to bridge this uncertainty gap. Whether we will or not, I don't know, but I think the only way that we might be able to do it is by somehow better linking both this scientific as well as this theological perspective. And this kind of bumps right up against the topic of neuroepistemology. How we come to know what we know, what, is, what are the limitations with which our brain can understand these kinds of concepts, uh, what are the abilities that our brain has to be able to understand reality and how we think about our world, the truth claims about our world, uh, does, can we learn better about the nature of science and religion and what they tell us about the world and whether or not we should accept those different ideas or not. These are the big questions that I think neurotheology as a general concept uh, can help us to address in, in broad ways. So what can we say about all of this? Well, I think ultimately, uh, certainly it's my hope, because uh, part of my career is banking on it, uh, 
that, uh, that neurotheology is going to be a real important field going forward. Um, I think that there is a lot of scholarship that we can do going forward. It may provide very important information for science. It may provide very important information for religious and spiritual ideas and beliefs. And hopefully, be, by creating this intersection, by creating this integrated approach, that we really may be able to get at some of these fundamental questions that we've never been able to get to before. Maybe this will propel us towards a new enlightenment. I can certainly be optimistic or idealistic. And, um, and of course, I always feel that a little, you know, one thing that often gets very missed in science and in theology is humor. So I certainly, I need to end at least with this statement that um, these were my principles and if you don't like them, I have others. Uh, as once said. And, um, and if you do have interest in looking at any of this in more detail, uh, you can look uh, for the book Principles of Neurotheology, Theology where I try to go into much greater detail about all the different issues and um, uh, problems and, uh, and principles that ultimately I hope will form a basis for this uh, very important field of scholarship, Neurotheology. So thank you very much, and I will turn it up to some questions.